area that came out as a, as a core area that our Board of Advisors recommended we focus on was on managing Generation Y. How many of our organizations are hiring Generation Y people? Yeah. And so, and the, the need to understand this generation and to work with this generation, to be able to operate and face the challenges that working with this generation faces will, is a major theme of this conference as well. Gene is an expert on managing millennials or Generation Y, whatever you prefer to call them. Gene has her PhD from the University of Michigan in psychology. She's a professor of psychology at San Diego State University. We won't hold that against you. Uh, and she's the author of uh, over 90 scientific peer-reviewed uh, publications in this area, so which is incredibly impressive for somebody as young as she is. Are you Gen Y? No. Technically? No. no. OK, on the verge, but Gen Not even on the verge. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can take that away. So without further ado, Gene, go ahead. Great. Great. So that is the cover of my book, Generation Me. And no, that is not my stomach. <laughs> That's me. Right off the bat, yes. Um, and that's uh, The Narcissism Epidemic, my second book with uh, my friend Keith Campbell. So that's the paperback. The hardcover actually had the great part on the bottom and it was reflective, it was a mirror. So you could see yourself on the cover of the book about narcissism. <laughs> that was lots of fun. Um, and my, my third book just came out and I went, I went really, honestly, yeah, a completely different direction um, because I have three kids now. And so uh, I, I wanted to write a research-based book about fertility and that was even more fun than the other two. I didn't have to criticize anybody in this one, so it was even more fun. Um, so back to generation. People really love to talk about generation. So it's, I, you know, cab drivers and a person next to an airplane, whatever, anytime I tell them what I do, I always get an earful. And I always enjoy it, too, hearing what people have to say. So you've probably heard some of the terms in this area before, uh, such as baby boomers. <laughs> How many baby boomers do we have out there? OK, good. Great. And keep your hands in the air for a moment, because I want the rest of the room to see that not all of you look like this guy. <laughs> at least, at least that's, what I, and that's what I usually say, at least not today. Okay, thank you. Um, so, shaping influences for baby boomers, post-war childhood, meaning post-World War II, uh, the Vietnam War as adolescents and young adults, um, the equality revolution in terms of race and gender and sexual orientation got started then, and perhaps because of that, baby boomers love to talk about journeys because they, they like to talk about getting there in the past and the journey because maybe because there was so much social change during their uh, childhood and especially adolescents and, and young adulthood. Now, in terms of technology, Boomers are sometimes described as digital immigrants, um, as opposed to digital natives um, in, in middle. <laughs> then we have Gen X. OK, so I'm a Gen Xer. How many other Gen Xers do we have? OK, a few of us. Now, good. Let's tell the rest of the room who this is in the picture, if you recognize him. Yes, it's the late great Kurt Cobain with Seattle grunge you know, from the early 90s. It was kind of one of those defining generational moments. But if you really look from the data and the influences in the culture for Gen X, the things that really shaped us were things like the consumerism of the 80s and the fall of communism and the importance of the individual, which I'll spend a lot of time on today. And in terms of technology, we are also digital immigrants, but at a younger age than the boomers were, at adolescents and young adults. But you look at companies like Yahoo and Google, uh, they were founded by Gen Xers. Okay, so then we have folks born after 1980, today's young generation. And uh, how many of uh, these young folks do we have with us today? Okay, good. We have at least a few here. This is always good. I have given talks where we're talking behind your back, and that's no good. We don't want to do that. Um, your generation doesn't have a completely agreed upon name. Um, there's a bunch of names that have been bandied around, like Gen Y, but that's a derivative, derivative of Gen X. And do you guys really want to be named after the people who are older than you? No, of course not. We're lame. Um, every generation thinks the older ones are lame, it's the way it goes. Millennials has really caught on in the last year or two, but I don't know, I never liked it. I always thought it kind of went out on New Year's Eve about 12 years ago, and you know, whoever talks about Y2K anymore, but it, it seems to be sticking. Um, and then I use Gen Me, although my favorite label has always been this one, I know iPods and iPhones and so on. Maybe that'll catch on for the name of the next group, we'll see. Um, that'd be great. Uh, especially those of you who are in this group, that a lot of older people don't even have a label for your generation, they just say this. Kids today. Yeah. <laughs> all the older people are like, yeah, we do. Um, shaping influences. September 11th, yeah. the recession that is still going on now. 
Um, and the thing that people think of first, usually, when they think of this group, which is technology, that you're the true digital natives in terms of the internet and cell phones and, and all of that good stuff. So, then what are we going to call the folks born after 2000? Those are my three daughters. Of course, I had to use them. Illustrate that. Um, my, uh, the, my favorite picture, though, is this, this uh, uh, older one of, of my oldest daughter. Power to the babies. <laughs> <laughs> the babies are taking over. Watch out. Yeah, and that's how it feels for generations getting older. Um, and USA Today actually just had a story today uh, in the top of the money section about what this generation is going to be called and the, the possible latest for the interview for that. So that was, that was lots of fun. Because um, who knows? Given what I do, it'll be really interesting for me to see uh, with my kids in this age group what that generation will be called and what they will be known for. Because that's really an open question. The odds. So, so. What's that? The odds. Really? The, the odd, well, that's the decade. Whether that will be, I hope the generation isn't called Generation Zero. That would be. <laughs> 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 so um, you know, we, we can talk about events and all of these things, and that that's fun. But when you really think about generations, and you really actually consider kind of theoretically, philosophically, what really shapes them, it's culture. In the way that uh, you might learn about it in uh, a class in cultural psychology or in anthropology, because this analogy works actually really well that growing up now is so different from what growing up in the 50s was like, say, for the baby boomers. It's like growing up in another country. Say the US versus China is just one example. Because think, think about all the things that are different, that's uh, the way it works. So this also means, none of this is about blaming. This is about cultural change, and generations reflect the cultural change. And the younger generation is going to reflect it more because it's the only world that they've ever known. So the way I sometimes put it to people with apologies, uh, to, you know, calling people who are now heading into their into their 30s kids, these kids didn't raise themselves. They're doing what the culture has taught them to do. So all of those influences that you think of, about what shaped you growing up, parents, teachers, school, what you watch on TV, all of that, that's where the culture gets reflected. So really briefly about how um, I have analyzed generations. When I first got interested in this topic, um, it's actually near the under, end of my undergraduate days. And there were some great books that had just started to come out on generations. But they took this kind of events view, a more sociological view. And I was really interested in the psychological part of it, about individuals and how do generations actually differ. So I started doing this work and found there hadn't been a whole lot done on it. So what I really wanted to find was psychological data on how actual people differ among generations. So the important thing in that is it's really difficult to draw any conclusions about generational differences if you have a sample from just one time. Because then you can't tell what's age and what's generation. So what you want, ideally, is data that goes back in time. So that's what I'm going to show you today, primarily, is data that um, can separate the effects of age and generation. Because it looks at, for example, people when they're 18 years old. But going back in time, you see the 60s and 70s, that's when the baby boomers were that age. So this is not stereotypes per se, because it is based on data. However, like most scientific studies and most surveys, it is based on averages. Of course, there's going to be exceptions. So, and the other caveat is, yes, there are generational similarities, and we have a lot of the same challenges that everybody faces, but it's the differences that cause the challenges in the workplace and at home and every place else. Um, one question I al always want to address right away is I'm often asked, well, the real, the real form of this question is, is basically, is it just the rich white kids? And the answer to that is no. When we've been able to look at diverse populations uh, and nationally representative samples and separate any of the trends by things like gender, ethnic groups, region, class, any of those things, yeah, there are differences in the psychological variables based on those demographics. But the generational trends are remarkably similar across those. Uh, and the diverse populations tend to show the same you know, either up or down movement on the traits that um, more selective groups do. OK, I want to start with some pop culture to set the stage. Uh, and Whitney Houston's been on my talk for a long time. She, uh, I just put her in uh, you know, after, after the sad recent events. Um, so we will honor her here in starting first with her hair, because it's from the 80s. So her cover from 1985, isn't that hair awesome? It really is. Of course, you know, I was in high school in the 80s. So, and it was in Dallas, Texas, no less. So my <laughs> high school graduation picture was like a white blonde version of this, basically. Um, so, a little hypocritical of me to make fun of it, but how can you, if my own picture up, I would do the same. I mean, you know, that was the great thing about that era. So this song is called The Greatest Love of All, and it was playing one day. My mom was uh, driving me to junior high. 
And I had heard the song before and she had not. So um, I said to her, Mom, the song's called The Greatest Love of All. What do you think it's about? And she said, oh, it has to be about children. And I said, Mom, that's very sweet. But no, that's not what the song is about. So here's some of the lyrics from that song from 1985. Everybody is searching for a hero. People need someone to look up to. I never found anyone to fill my needs, so I learned to depend on me. I found the greatest love of all inside of me. The greatest love of all is easy to achieve. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Now, by this time, 85, this was a fairly accepted point of view, that you wanted to love yourself, self-esteem was important, and all of those things. But what's remarkable is not that long before this, 20 years before that, even thir especially 30 years before that, say in 1955, this would have been considered very odd to say that loving yourself was important, much less that it was the greatest love. Back then, the greatest love would have been for children, like my mom said, or for God, or for country. That it'd be for yourself would be just kind of strange and selfish sounding and weird. Nobody would really, really even think about that. And if you got to somebody on the street in 1955 and said, do you have high self-esteem? They probably would have said, do I have high what? <laughs> they would have had really no idea what you were talking about. But by 85, everybody knew that word. They knew they were supposed to have it. Um, but the other thing is, in 1955, if you talked about loving yourself, they probably would have thought you were talking about something else. <laughs> <laughs> so this idea of self-esteem, some of you took a little longer to get that. <laughs> we got there eventually. They're not quite as fast over there. So this idea of self-esteem being so important has led to a number of very interesting cultural trends, such as everybody gets a turn. Very, very common now in children's sports leagues, and has been since the 90s, unheard of a generation or, or two ago, that if you show up, you get a trophy. And you sit on the bench, you get a trophy. You suck, you still get the trophy. <laughs> <laughs> My 10-year-old nephew has one of these pretty big trophy about like this big, and it says, excellence and participation. <laughs> what? <laughs> what does that even mean? I'm good at showing up? I don't know. Then yeah. So the, another thing some of the sports leagues do is everybody's trophy is the same size, no matter who wins or loses, and that resembles real life oh so much. Uh, or they don't keep score at all, so there's no winners and no losers. Uh, oh, parents tell me the kids keep score. And then it's bled into education. In some elementary school classrooms, there is the idea that you should not correct children's mistakes because it will harm their self-esteem. <laughs> so we have self-esteem coloring books. This has uh, always been one of my favorite examples. Because this one has this is the cover of it. It has this thing about every how great they are. Number one, first place honor roll, including this is the cat. Number one cat. Self-esteem for cats. <laughs> That's going to be the next big thing. Good dog. Good dog. Good dog. Good he must have low self-esteem. <laughs> I think he got it from drinking out of the toilet. <laughs> That's always been my favorite. Okay, so here's one of the activities in the book. You can see what that says. You are special, which is narcissism and not self-esteem. <laughs> so you know, this is one of our most closely held cultural beliefs in America today, that self-esteem is really important, that it's essential for success, that we need to teach it to children. Here is the problem with that belief. Big research review came out on this a couple of years ago. And the causation doesn't go that way. A lot of the already small, fairly small relationship between self-esteem and say good grades, good behavior, all of those things, uh, is explained by outside variables, like say coming from a stable household. And then what's left is explained this way. The kids who behave well and get good grades develop high self-esteem, not the other way around. Trying to Build up self-esteem for no particular reason. You're special just for being you, kind of the way that you, you often do it. That puts the cart before the horse. It, it doesn't work that way. Another illustration of how there's not such a close connection between self-esteem and success, as many people believe, is here in the US, the ethnic group that has the lowest self-esteem is Asian Americans. And the kids have the best academic performance, and the adults have the lowest unemployment rate. Now, this is a cultural thing because this is a culture that places more importance on self-improvement instead of just thinking highly of yourself. There's a distinction there that's important, and it may actually be one of the reasons for the, the higher performance. So, another problem, of course, is that self-esteem can cause problems if it's not based in reality. It's tempting to say that's not the way we've been teaching it, but perhaps we have. So, I, I've uh, done a lot of research on this question of positive self-views increasing over the generations. So what I'll share with you today is just the most recent and the largest study on that topic. And in this case, 
I'm drawing from uh, this very large survey that's run out of UCLA, gets a nationwide <coughs> sample, national representative sample every year of uh, entering college students. Huge sample. On these questions, 7 million respondents since 1966. It's a great uh, re resource to find generational differences. And one of the questions, or actually a series of questions that it asks, is rate yourself on each of the following traits as compared with the average person your age. So if you're choosing highest 10% or above average, you're saying, yeah, I think I'm better than my peers at this particular trait. So what I was interested in is are there generational differences in thinking that you are above average compared to your peers? So just for the sake of simplicity, I'm gonna show you the endpoints. 66, that's entering college students 1966, that's gonna be the uh, first wave of the boomer generation. And then the most recent data is very recent, it is from just this past fall in 2011, and that's the Gen B or Millennial Gen Y sample. Okay, so what percentage in each of those generations believe that they are above average in these traits? So the first is intellectual self-confidence, and there's been a clear rise in that. Social self-confidence, more also there, more think they're above average compared to the previous generation. Um, drive to achieve, leadership ability, public speaking ability, writing ability, which many college faculty would challenge, <laughs> math ability, artistic ability, and general academic ability. Now we wanted to consider alternative explanations for this, so the first one we considered was maybe people actually have gotten smarter. That's a possibility. So we looked at standardized test scores, say at the SAT or there's other um, assessments of educational progress that are taken in 12th grade. Those are either unchanged or down. So that doesn't seem to be the explanation. Another one is, well, this is a college sample. What about has selectivity changed? Well, more people go to college now than did in the mid-1960s. So if you're going to think about them comparing themselves to the average person, this is a less select sample as time goes on. If, you were, if it was explained by how selective the sample actually was, these numbers would go down instead of up. So that didn't seem to be the explanation either. So those are those two explanations that we considered. Now next we said, what about working harder? Well, okay, their intelligence, at least on the standardized tests, is the same. But they're thinking they're above average. Maybe they're thinking this because they work more. Uh, that's possible. And then the second one we wanted to look at was grades. So subjective feedback that they're getting from teachers, uh, which is kind of a cultural indicator in a lot of ways. How has that changed? So we look at that within uh, this nationally representative sample of high school students, try to take out any college selectivity issues as well. And that one goes back to the mid-70s. So first, here's how uh, grades have changed. The percentage actually got down by a little bit. Not a huge difference, but the opposite from what you might think, given the grades. So this may be part of the reason why we have such positive self-views. And that study I showed you in and others is at least one, one explanation. There are many, like general cultural change. This is an indicator of that cultural change, of focusing on boosting self-esteem and this subjective feedback being much higher in terms of A averages. So Calvin says, is bad grades lowering my self-esteem? His teacher says, you should work harder so you don't get bad grades. And he says, your denial of my victimhood is lowering my self-esteem. <laughs> when I give this talk to undergraduates, they do not laugh at this slide. <laughs> it's bizarre. Um, it's almost like they don't get the joke. <laughs> yeah, it says something in and of itself, I suppose. <laughs> so now we really get that fun, right? talked about narcissism. So narcissism is a personality trait. There's a clinical level disorder called NPD, um, but I won't really uh, talk too much about that today. Here we're going to concentrate on normal narcissism or garden variety narcissism <laughs> because there's plenty of self-centeredness to be had before you get to the really high level of crazy, right? <laughs> so it's being uh, self-important, having an inflated sense of yourself is the basic definition. But it's a really multifaceted, fascinating trait. It includes, for example, entitlement, believing that you're special, that you deserve special treatment. Uh, I'm often asked, what's the difference between self-esteem and narcissism? There's a couple of important differences. One is, you really boil it down. Self-esteem is confidence. Narcissism is overconfidence. Not just thinking that you're good, but thinking that you're really good, and probably having that inflated sense that's unrealistic. Another question, okay, well, do narcissists have high self-esteem or do they actually have low self-esteem? Are they actually covering? Is their grandiosity actually covered for low self-esteem? 
Well, if you give somebody a narcissism inventory and a self-esteem inventory, the same, time, the same people tend to score high on, on both. There's a positive correlation between the two measures. But maybe the narcissistic people are just saying that on the paper and pencil questionnaire. So more recently, some researchers have looked at how to measure self-esteem implicitly in a more subtle way. So for example, they'll have people do a computer program where they'll measure their reaction time to pairing words like I and me with words like bad and good. And so they can get a more in-depth look to see what self-esteem actually looks like deep down inside. So when you do that, it turns out narcissists uh, deep down inside think that they're awesome. They have very high self-esteem, even when it's measured in this more subtle way. So that idea of them actually have covering low self-esteem does not seem to be true, at least by the ways we've been able to measure it so far. Here's one of the differences, though. Someone who's high in self-esteem but not narcissism, yeah, they also have that confidence. They place that importance on individual areas of achievement, but they also highly value their relationships with others. Narcissists are missing that piece of valuing their relationships with others kind of caring and communal traits. That's one of the biggest differences between the two. So as a result, um, narcissists tend to lack empathy, they have poor relationship skills. Um, there's a whole, this is a whole other topic too, uh, about narcissism and leadership. Um, to boil it down, narcissists often take the reins as leaders, say if you do a small, small group, so you do an experiment, uh, and they'll take the reins and be the leader, but then after a few sessions, everybody hates them. That's what ends up happening because they don't really know how to relate to other people all that well, it's just about them. They want to be a leader, but they're not actually all that great at it. You're not going to name names, okay. are you? I am not. I can't. People over there are slumping down in their chair. Uh, I'm not going to name names in this room. I'm not going to name other people. All right, so what are we doing in our schools and with our kids to discourage narcissism? Well, if anything, we seem to be encouraging it. This is a project called All About Me, which is very common. I did one of these when I was in junior high in the 80s. I didn't mind a construction paper. A lot of kids now do it as a PowerPoint presentation, so that's progress. Uh, then, even at younger ages, what are we doing? Um, this is a song that three and four year olds will often sing in preschool. Uh, they do it in kindergarten as well. And I hope you had a good lunch because we're going to sing. <laughs> you over already been interacting, we're good. Okay, so take a little break really briefly and stretch a little bit. Test your voice. <laughs> okay, everybody know the tune? Okay, so I will I will lead you, but the more of you who join in, the less you have to hear me, which is probably a good thing. Why do you have to okay. lead? Thought maybe I would, but all right. Is everybody ready? Okay, I have the prompter, that's fine. Okay, here we go. I am special, I am special. Look at me, you will see. Someone very special, someone very special. It is me. It is me. All right, give us all the hands. Do you, do you feel the narcissist, the person through your veins now? And this is a song for three, four-year-old kids, too. If you have kids who work with kids, they are narcissistic enough already at that age. That is the essence of being a preschooler. Um, and it used to be that our job, you know, as parents, educators, and so on, was to tell them that the world did not revolve around them. And now we tell them that it does. And I saw you doing the version that the kids do where they point to themselves. Yes, yes. You see, well, that's how they do it. They, they, they say, I just look at me. And as you're going to see in a moment, um, this song manages to knock off two items on the narcissistic personality inventory within the first three lines of the song. <laughs> and I'm occasionally asked, do they still do this really? Hasn't there been a backlash? Guess what my kid, my kindergartner, my five-year-old came home with a month ago singing. They were doing it in her school. Yep. So it is still around. All right. So the study that I did um, to try to nail down some of these trends among individuals as well as the culture um, was on about 25,000 college students, about 104 samples, and they had completed the narcissistic personality inventory at some point between 1982 and 2009 in this particular analysis. So I'm going to show you a couple of the items from the NPI because they really kind of show you um, how complex and interesting this trait is. So here's some items from the narcissistic inventory. If I ruled the world, it would be a better place. Always been one of my favorites because there's always a few people smile and laugh, and the rest of the room is looking around going, Why is that funny? Of course it would be. <laughs> yeah. I can live my life any way I want to. I think I am a special person. I like to be the center of attention. Those are the two we get in the song. I am special. Look at me. 
And I have a natural talent for influencing people. So there's some manipulativeness to the trait as well. Okay, so how has that changed in these college student samples since the early 80s? Here's how the scores have changed. Now, how big has that changed? That's always a question you gotta ask. It's not huge, but it is very noticeable because in the early 80s, about 16, 17% answered the majority of the items in the narcissistic direction. It's a 40 item scale, so that's a 21 or above. There's not an agreed upon cutoff on this, but that's as good as any, that you're answering most of the questions in that direction. So it used to be about 17%, and now it's 30%. It also shows it's not the majority of today's college students who are scoring at that more problematic level of narcissism, 70% or not, but there are twice as many who aren't. And I think that makes it very noticeable because those are the ones who end up in your office. Whether you're a faculty member or a manager, inevitably, they're the ones who end up in the long run causing you the problems. And so that makes the difference look even bigger than it, than it actually is. And a doubling is fairly considerable. All right, now where did this come from? Lots of places. Um, we'll take a step back and just kind of anecdotally look at some of the uh, trends in our culture that seem to be encouraging narcissism. So, Social networking, uh, especially when Twitter first came out, everybody said, you really want to know what everybody had for breakfast? Really the point. Um, then we've got uh, reality TV across the board. Very, very narcissistic people and behaviors. Uh, Mike, the situation here is my favorite. The <laughs> ab pointing. Um, so, and the other thing is he's 30 years old. So get life. <laughs> <laughs> so Paris Hilton wearing a shirt with Paris Hilton on it. After she got out of jail, she said she was going to become a humanitarian. That worked out well. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. 90210 here with some breast implants. Plastic surgery rates have increased, um, depending on the procedure, either doubled or even tripled or quadrupled um, since 1997 when they first started collecting statistics on that. We have an iPod with some bling. Then we've got a McMansion here. So <laughs> let's think about how this recession started. It was the mortgage meltdown. Remember how I mentioned overconfidence earlier? Is that an ex doesn't that sound exactly like what happened on the part of the people making the loans, buying the houses, uh, all those mortgage-backed securities, they're fine. Housing never goes down. Overconfidence. It really does explain. I'm not saying all these people are narcissistic. The point is that thinking is really what brought down our economy of being too overconfident and overly optimistic. Uh, and it, it mirrors exactly the way narcissistic people behave in lab experiments, say, with a stock market simulation. When the stock market is going down, they lose their shirts. They do much worse than more cautious investors because they take too many risks because of the overconfidence. Okay, the last one here is uh, fights on YouTube. So, you know, high school kids always beat each other up, but now the new twist is you fight and you film it to get attention for beating somebody up. Um, law enforcement loves this because then you have filmed your crime. <laughs> Speaking of overconfidence. <laughs> then there's my favorite example, which is that it is now possible to hire fake paparazzi <laughs> to follow you around when you go out at night. I am not making this up. This is one of the sites that will do this for you. Yeah. Even in a recession, they keep expanding to new cities. They say they'll ask questions, why for coverage, shut your name, everything you've seen on oh. TV. But they say, we think hardworking people deserve this even more than celebrities. <laughs> At the end of the night, you can go home with the pictures on the cover of the fake celebrity magazine. Wow. Um, What's that website? <laughs> <laughs> well, is, your, is your mom's birthday coming up? That's all right. They're, yeah. wa they're waiting outside, Joe. Yeah, or, or your grandmothers will have no idea why somebody's running around taking pictures themselves of her. So I do like using song lyrics. I actually have done um, some studies of song lyrics, which um, I can tell you about later if you'd like, but uh, I am being sarcastic here. Some nice, humble, humble songs. It's really amazing when you start listening to uh, the lyrics, how, how much narcissism you can hear. This is actually a gorgeous song. I want to be a billionaire, but you'll walk around <laughs> singing it, and you're going, wait, wait, I'm singing such a narcissistic song. Stop. That's what I did the first time I heard it. Because you think about it, it's uh, really not what you want to be singing. Every time I close my eyes, I see my name in shining lights. The world better prepare for when I'm a billionaire. <laughs> I love this one. Because I'm awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a leader. I'm a winner. Kind of like Charlie Sheen, right? Because <laughs> I'm awesome. I don't need you because I'm neato and I beat you. <laughs> Some of the aggression and narcissism there, too. Uh, she's not being sarcastic. If you watch the YouTube video of this, she's got a big red arrow pointing to herself. The world should revolve around me. 
I had a lot of failed relationships. There's a lot of honesty about that part of it too. I don't get involved because I'm not equipped. There's only one me in the galaxy. I believe the world should revolve around me. Then the last song, you don't need any lyrics. You can just get it from the song title. Don't you wish your girlfriend was hot like me? <laughs> <laughs> now, when I give this talk to a younger audience, the first few times I did it, including my own undergraduates, I, I had to be really mad at me, right? And I was actually kind of surprised that most of them agreed, yeah, we see. You know, we're, nar we're narcissistic, duh. You know, we look around us, we see the culture, we can see that. I t I, a couple of years ago, teamed up with a national survey company to find out if my students were just being nice to me. Um, and they did this anonymous survey, and two thirds of uh, the students did agree, yeah, we think our generation is more narcissistic than those that went before. However, here's where the conversation inevitably will go next. They will say, but we have to be this way because the world is so competitive now. Now, I agree with that idea about things being competitive, there's no denying that. But the problem with that argument is that narcissism will not help you to succeed. So we know this from a bunch of studies now. Objectively speaking, narcissists are not any smarter or any more beautiful or any more successful than anybody else. They just think they are. They are legends in their own minds. So for physical appearance, my favorite paper on this is called Narcissists Think They Are So Hot, But They Are Not. <laughs> if you look um, at performance, so a couple studies that have looked at performance uh, in college, they usually have lower GPAs, are more likely to drop out. And then in business, some of you may have read the book Good to Great, and he studied the profiles of CEOs and found it wasn't the most narcissistic who were the successful ones who took their companies from not just good to great. It was those who were humble and hardworking and gave their teams credit. It was those people skills um, that really helped them succeed. Oh, and I chose this illustration because she'll have a better chance of becoming successful if she learns how to spell becoming. <laughs> and I did not Photoshop that. Okay, so there's good news too. Um, it's, it tends to be that the, some, some of them are to be the cause the, the generational conflicts, but there's plenty of good news for this group as well. Extroversion has gone up. That's something that's often very useful in business. Um, again, traits like assertiveness and, and dominance when it doesn't cross over into narcissism, very useful for succeeding in business, and those have gone up. Uh, Self-esteem, not the be-all and end-all for success that we've uh, kind of been led to believe it is, but it has some good uh, protective qualities and has some benefits, and that has, has gone up too. All of those are good until they're not. Uh, you look at our cultural history of individualism, it really illustrates that you can't have too much of a good thing. So encouraging uh, equality is great, and that's individualism as well. Encouraging people to be assertive and stand up for themselves and go for their goals, that's good. But then when it crosses over into you're special, you can do anything you want, et cetera, then we end up with that problematic population Still a minority, but you know, causing the problems of more narcissism. I also think that's why there's such disparate views of this generation. That's true for every generation. There's the Gen Xers, we're slackers, no, they're internet millionaires. I mean, we have a history of that. Same thing with boomers. Oh, they're the go-getters, they're the hard workers, no, they're the hippies. So same thing here, but here it's especially divided. And I think it's because both are right. There are both positive and negative things. Um, and the majority are not crossing over to the negative level, the entitlement and narcissism, but there's two to three times as many who are compared to the previous groups, and that's really noticeable. So the positive stuff is also true, and we will have to, have to keep that in mind. Here's the other piece of good news I, I have to mention, uh, which is the equality revolution. And this is also individualism, but it's the benefit that I think almost everybody would agree is really good as an outcome of individualism and of the social change that we've experienced. So occasionally people will say to me, oh man, you're always talking about maybe it's narcissistic, sounds like you want to go back in the 50s. This is why my answer is a resounding no. Uh, partially as a woman and a working mom, but just as a human being, it's great that we don't have so much prejudice anymore, that we have more opportunities for people regardless of background. And that's, that's also, this is what happens when you treat people as individuals. Uh, and, and you limit it to that, and then you're not taking it too far for narcissism. This is the big upside, and it's also one of the biggest strengths of this generation. All right, I'm going to show you a little bit of data on uh, generational attitudes toward work, um, and then we'll get into our applications pretty right after that. So there's been a fair number of studies that have looked at generational differences in work attitudes, but almost all of them have had one-time samples. And in those, it is impossible to separate the effects of age and career stage from those of generation. 
And what you really want is data that goes back in time. And fortunately, it's out there. This big uh, sample I mentioned before of high school students uh, goes all the way back to the 70s. So you're, you are looking at people when they're high school seniors, so they haven't, most of them are thinking about starting their careers or will after they finish college. Um, but it gives you that view where you can say it's not just age, you can take age out of the equation and see what the generational differences are. So I'll show you for each generation what their top five things are for job attributes. What did they rank the highest? So for boomers, it was a job that's interesting, where I don't have to pretend to be someone I'm not, that uses my skills, has a predictable and secure future, and where I can see results. So that was boomers when they were measured high school seniors in the mid-70s. Okay, what about Gen Xers? And this is a sample from uh, the early 1990s. Well, it was pretty much the same. The only thing that changed is good chance for advancement and promotion moved up to a place where I can see results. Then for Gen Me slash millennials or Gen Y, Top there is still interesting. Don't have to pretend and use my skills. Good chance for advancement and promotion picks up to number four, and chance to earn a good deal of money goes into number five. So what you see is there's this generational similarity with the top three, and then what you get is a shift from a more intrinsic motivation of where I can see results to the more extrinsic of the advancement and promotion and money. Now, here's a few of some of the other questions on the survey. And in this case, we're going to have boomers at zero, and then it's going to go from there so you can concentrate on the change. One of the questions, so I think this is really interesting, is do you agree work is just making a living? And more recent generations are more likely to say yes. What about if you want a job with a lot of vacation time? Yes. Are you willing to work overtime? And that has gone <laughs> down. Now most to be fair, most still say yes, I'm willing to work overtime, but it's fewer uh, than said that previously. Now these next three actually really surprised me. You saw the interesting is still is ranked number one across all three generations. But in the absolute value, what happens to that trend? It actually goes down somewhat, which I expected it to go up by the absolute uh, rating because there's a lot of people talking about millennials, they want meaning and work, but that's actually gone down in this survey. What about a job where you can make friends? or where you can help others, and those have gone down as well. It's almost like, I don't want the job, I just want to go on vacation. Um, <laughs> these are, again, more intrinsic motivations. Um, so, because there are some things that still are important, like money and respect, a job where you can get respect. Okay. So my portion, my main portion, will end with this question. I think this is the big question uh, for this generation and for, for everybody in the next five to 10 years. How much is the world going to change for the generation? How much is the generation going to change to adapt to the world? It's going to be some of both. We've already seen a lot of these changes in the business world um, with more praise, more flexibility, uh, less top-down authority. If we can find win-win solutions, things that the generation likes, but it's still really good for the, for the bottom line. Uh, I think the organizations that can do that will be the most successful now and in the future. Thank you very much. And I think we have about five minutes for questions. Are we good yeah. on time? Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So I, I've talked to colleagues about this trend uh, in the Middle East, in Asia, and in Europe yeah. to see if they notice the same thing. Yeah. And they said they did. Okay. So I'm curious if any of your research has looked at this internationally and you yeah. see the same trends occurring internationally. Yeah. Most of what I've done has been um, you know, focused on the U.S. It's the data I know, it's the culture I know, things like that. But I've been really happy to see there have been more researchers around the world doing this type of work, too. Um, a great paper from Finland came across my desk the other day. Um, there's um, a couple researchers in China who are looking at generational differences, too. Uh, I've seen a couple that have looked at differences in work attitudes. They're, they're, one, they're the one-time studies that can't separate age and generation, but they still give a view. And at least some of their results, especially with the work-life balance issues, do seem to be reflecting the same trends that we're seeing here. I think that's going to be one of the best um, areas for research in the next 10 years is to find out which trends um, you know, are, are going to be similar in international um, contexts and, and which aren't. A lot of them do seem to be similar. This American individualism seems to be spreading around the world, which is probably why they're seeing a lot of the same trends. That'd be my guess anyway. Yeah. So if you, you showed three separate generations during their high school years. That's right. If you, what about 
the same generation over a series of decades? How do, how do their wants and interests tend to evolve? Yeah, so um, the few studies I know about that, in terms of work attitudes, which is what we were looking at there, they tend to stay relatively stable. So of course there are you know, changes as you move through your career in, in attitudes, but um, many of them, the, you know the old, the old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks? That change um, tends to be a little bit less than say the generational shifts. So in general, there are some changes with the, with the age and career stage that happen across all generations. So uh, the making friends at work part tends to show up more among younger people. Uh, you get uh, a little less focus on promotion when you're older because you've already been promoted. So there's those things that, that you expect to show up. Uh, but a, a lot of the, that orientation, especially with like the work-life balance, where it's more kind of an attitude toward work in general, they tend to be pretty stable. So, so if, we, if we had an earlier this morning presentation that suggested that newer entrants into the workforce are less focused on money, more for, focused on balance, more focused on maybe social good. Right. Um, as they get more money or as they have families that need more money, they still may feel as they do today. So that may not go away. Um, it depends. It so depends. The question is, is so, money contagious? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think, I think the, the challenge in all of this is we don't have the perfect study, which would be the type of thing that I showed you across all age groups, and then we followed them all for a 40-year period. That, to my knowledge, doesn't exist, because then you could separate age, time period, and generation. You could do everything. And we don't really have that. So we have to take the timeline stuff. That's what I showed you here, each generation when they're young. Then we look at the one-time ones, and we have to figure out for the one-time ones how much is age and how much is generation. And I think that has caused a lot of confusion in this area because there's a, a, so much of the research out there is one time, and they said, well, you know, millennials are out there looking for meaning. Well, yeah, probably because they're young. That's what it seems to suggest, because when you go back, that's not what you see when you look at, that, at their generation compared to others at the same age. So that's always the challenge is in those one time ones, trying to tease those apart, it's just so hard. Gender differences at all in your research? Yeah. Generally, the trends are, are pretty similar across them. Um, so narcissism is actually one of the few exceptions. The change in narcissism for girls and women has been stronger than that for men. Um, so men still score higher in narcissism, but us girls are catching up fast. It's basically what it says. Uh, so almost everything else, there are differences based on gender in terms of the attitudes and personality traits, but the generational trends are, are very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to answer this, but have you enrolled any of your daughters in uh, uh, beauty pageants? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just, just testing the yes. hypothesis. Not my thing. Okay. Yeah, it actually, it, well. <laughs> if you saw my kindergartner, the way she goes to school with her hair all tangled, you wouldn't even have to ask that. <laughs> yeah. Probably makes me a bad parent, but at least I'm not putting her in toddlers and tiaras, right? <laughs> I have a question about intrinsic motivation. Mm -hmm. The relationship between the boomer bosses and millennials. I spoke this morning, and so one of the questions I'm working through right now is that like disconnect between how a boss who has a millennial under him wants him to get work harder. So like Dan right. keeps talking about this. So what they think is incentive, you know, incentivize, give money. Where companies like Google or uh, you know Alassian out of Australia have done more like intrinsic motivation. What makes you happy? How do we make your job so? How does that conversation happen within like your workforce? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I can tell you right off the bat, data that I, that I, I, I didn't have a chance to show you today um, on values and life goals, that was one of the biggest changes by far, the shift between the boomers and through the Xers to, to now to the millennials, is a decline in the importance of, of intrinsic <laughs> values. Things like finding meaning. Uh, there's another item on, uh, such as a funny item, but developing a meaningful philosophy of life. Three fourths of boomers when they were in college said, Yes, that's really important. Now people go, What even? I don't even know what that is. Um, and then the meaning and purpose has also shown that too. And the extrinsic stuff uh, shows the increase. So, at least based on that, based on that kind of idea of the, the generational character, um, I mean, I'd expect you know, one thing that would play out would be that the boomer would just be rattling on about. Um, sorry, you can tell I'm a Gen Xer that I just said boomers rattle on. That's terrible. Um, it's, it's terrible I'd say that, not terrible that they do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, my own bias. 
Um, okay. <laughs> so they would be talking about, you know, here's the meaning, and here's this larger purpose, and and I and I think for a fair, not, not all, but a fair amount of the other generation, they're going to think, oh, it's that baby boomer stuff again. Um, so it does. I think it does have to be more more concrete. It can be about meaning and purpose, but it has to be more personal. It has to be, here's how I can make a difference, here's how I can have an impact, here's how it will help my career, not necessarily the things that the younger folks will think of as kind of the, oh, baby boomer pie in the sky stuff. But, yeah, you can have intrinsic, but it has to be more personalized. And I think that's probably the easiest way to try to bridge the gap. Okay, I think we have time for this one last question. Sadly, I'm a baby boomer. But I'm not, I don't feel I'm out of touch. And in looking at, and I'm not cynical either, but when I looked at a lot of the charts, and there were a lot of similarities between baby boomers, Gen X, and Gen Y, except for we seem to see a lot more narcissism and self-entitlement in Gen Y. Why are we as companies so incredibly afraid of this? And why are we catering to this? And, and I'm, I know I'm sounding really nasty here, but you know, in your last slide said, should we change or should they change? And that seems to be the, the point. It just seems so difficult for us to sort of hire people and not give them everything they want, which is insane. Yeah. I, I don't know if that's not, a that's comment or a question. I, I yeah. Just. No, I agree. We have to find a happy medium. And that, that really is my conclusion after looking at all of this, that, yeah, we, we don't want to take that position of, yeah, giving them everything they want. That's not the, the way to go. Um, we don't go bankrupt, basically. So they were one of the reasons not, not to do that, among others. Um, so we, we have we have to bridge the gap. So you know, I, 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 in, in teaching, the way that I've tried to do that is, um, you know, I've said, well, if I if I give my students who are this generation, if I give them everything they want, basically everybody get an A for no work, right? And they business a little bit of that, that's going bankrupt. So you don't want to do that. But there's things that I can do to um, help the class, um, you know, be more entertaining for them. So they're not used to the long passages of text, so I do shorter ones, and do images, and do uh, videos, and ask questions, and mix it up more, and so on. And that's, that's a win-win. Okay. They like that better, and it helps them learn better, and I'm still getting across the material I need to teach them, so we're not educationally bankrupt. So I think those, those types of, of solutions are, are important, because we don't want to go all the way one way or all the way another way. And I also, to just kind of reflect your, your earlier point, we, all, we do have to keep in mind how much we have in common, too. I mean, mm -hmm. just as a general message, and here, I am going to sound like a baby boomer, um, <laughs> which is we all have these things in common as human beings, and I think we'd all get along better if we were focusing on what we have in common rather than all this stuff about specialness and uniqueness. So that is a message I resonate with. Thank you. All right.
So there was no problems. It no. just didn't let you. No, I really would like to leave projects, and I have a lot of new ideas, and they just weren't getting anywhere, so I left. Uh, yeah, you're going to be entry level at our company. <laughs> 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 With one year experience, you're going to have to do a bit more time before you can lead anything. Okay, okay um, thank you. I, this isn't going to be a good fit. <laughs> have a good day. <laughs> tips that I'll go through uh, that I usually mention and then uh, we can just decide and discuss among ourselves if there's other ones you want to come up with and then we can have uh, our actors redo the scene maybe taking some of those tips into account so these are my general ones and then we will see what uh, will we'll fit best for uh, having our actors redo it um, so one thing I, I always do suggest is um, we, we place so much importance on confidence but we also don't want the overconfidence of narcissism so uh, you want to First of all, when you're recruiting people, ensure that you're, you're screening out uh, those who are going to end up in your office um, and causing those problems. So that's kind of step one. Um, here's, here's another one. So, you know, the, the Gen Y label is usually written as a letter, the one letter Y, capital Y, but some people say it should be written this way, W-H-Y, question mark. Uh, and I've noticed this in my students as well. You really have to put things in, in context. You've got to explain why it matters. Now, it's not as much in the baby more sense of the meaning and the, and the larger purpose. It's, well, what do you do here? And why is it important? Because that means, why am I going to be important? How can I have the personal impact? And then, of course, the idea of moving up and being the project lead. What are the opportunities for me here? Because I don't want to be um, entry level. I want to I move up. So if you're going to bring me as entry level, at least tell me what things uh, I can think about for in the future. What is my career path? What are the opportunities if I really do well? Um, another thing is because of that difference in work-life balance, and it was the largest generationally difference uh, that we found in, the, in that study, um, that flexibility and time off and so on is um, going to be something that will often be very important to this group. Um, okay, so those, those are, we, can, we're, we don't need the screen for a title one, that's just a general tip I like to give. Uh, but we have two here, kind of the generation Y and explaining uh, what's important, and then the time off and flexibility. Any others that uh, you'd like to throw out there as ones that have, have worked for you in recruiting uh, enthusiastic young employees to your organization? We, we talk a lot about how we give back to the organization, what it means to be a good community, you know, a corporate community partner, and, and offer opportunities, especially during our down, slower times to get out there and you know, plant trees in the park or, or whatever it is. And that, that, that hits with kind of like that, right? You know. We're hoping to do some testimonials, short videos that we put on YouTube and stuff that show how people have moved along, how they have found fulfilling work within the organization. Yeah. They also want to know that you're talking to a lot of the savvy. Mm, right. Good one. And an iPad. Yeah. <laughs> so what else comes with it? Yeah. Social media. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. They like to hear that. They like the idea of mentoring. They like, and they like the idea of someone looking out for them and trying to help them succeed. And so, okay. That's something that Treasure Medical does. So, enables them to actually cut the annual growth, the average salary, and still increasing the crop. So, they find everyone when they come in as a career coach. Okay. A career coach. Interesting. Right. Let's do that one. Okay, you want to do that one? Let's do that sure. One. Yeah, the career coach and the development, and it kind of uh, it builds off the opportunities for promotion we have here on the slide. So, sure, actors, what do you think? Okay. <laughs> well, improv. Second city. Improv. Second city. Yeah. Fall out of situation. Second city. Okay. And take two. Yeah. <laughs> So, you're interested in mail marketing? I am. Great. Could you tell me more about it? Sure. We're a very modern company. We've got a, a very diverse group of employees. Um, uh, I want to say um, not everyone is old like myself, so we have a <laughs> lot of kids like yourself who are in the company. But um, everything in between. We've got 
uh, lots of people who are doing everything they can to be involved both with the, with the company as well as in the community. They, uh, we, we always manage you um, almost one-on-one. -on -one. You have someone who takes really good care of you. Uh, I'm very proud to be partnered with you, show you the yeah. steps, help you work your way up the ladder because you're starting at an entry level and we want to make sure that you progress to a lead position. Okay, so we have entry someone. level. So how, how exactly would that work? What Do I have opportunities for promotion? Because I wasn't really looking for entry level at this point. Definitely have opportunities for promotion. Everyone will hopefully move up if you want to. Not everyone wants to be in a lead. Um, so you can definitely jump in and depending on how your uh, counterpart, your boss, so to speak, um, feels you're performing. <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> you know, we don't like to use the word boss, though. So. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's kind of, kind of stuffy, sorry. Uh, so, how they feel you're doing, you may progress above your peers and people who've been there longer than you, possibly by virtue that they don't want to be in a leadership position. And if you have those skills, of course, the uh, mentor that you have will help coach you and make sure that you have what it takes. If I were looking to be a project leader, if I had to start an entry level, I guess I'm wondering what sort of things would that come with? If I have to start there, how would I be moving up? Well, just Career working coach. on the project. Career coach. <laughs> Career coach. <laughs> yeah. your, your, your mentor, as I mentioned a moment ago, will assist you with these steps. And, and I'd like to say that as we uh, have seen in other uh, uh, corporations, we have a website where you can click and uh, look at the uh, attributes and the requirements for the next position or two higher than what you are currently working to find out what you need to do to progress to that level. So you can, along with your mentor, your coach, your boss, um, look at those and work towards those goals so that you can move up the ladder and become a lead. That would be great. Excellent. Yeah, I, I think I'm interested. That would be cool. There's something else we, we just recently started. You know YouTube, right? Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> some of our more promising prospects have found it uh, interesting to uh, video. The, the boss obviously is in with that little cooperation. Um, video their performance at, at, at the job and I guess expounding on their uh, attributes and how their potential is going to benefit the company. We post that on the website. And a couple of those. Uh, humble to say that have gone viral on YouTube. So you can probably look those up. Could be one of your coworkers. No, that's excellent. I definitely want to learn more. Thank great. You. Great. Cool. It's getting cooler. Oh, it's getting better. And I feel somewhat vindicated. It's a great example of a baby boomer rattling on. Now, here's the, here's the thing though. You know, I, I have kids now. Of course, what do they think about me? They think that I rattle on too long. And that's kind of, I, I got to tell you this quick story because it, it is worth it. Um, I did that once when my daughter was about three and a half, and they're talking something about re election of some politician or another. She said, Mommy, what's re election? I'm like, oh, this is a great teaching opportunity. All right, so I tell her what it is, and I do do my best to kind of get that condensed into like a 30 second explanation. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about it, and then and she, she, I, I finish, and I wrapped it up in a way that a three-year-old can understand. She looks at me, and she says, Mommy, sometimes people poop in their underwear. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she was thinking about when I was doing my very good explanation of real life. That's what she was thinking about. Hopefully nobody here was. <laughs> so, from that, she motivated me. That's motivation. Uh, yeah. That's motivation. Challenge so, on Yes. <laughs> so if you're going to say you've got the employees, so you, you've hired them, they, they like your spiel, the job fair, you, you bring them in, uh, and then day to day, you know, how, how are you going to motivate them? So that phrase, making a difference, has become so popular in the last five or ten years, and it really resonates uh, with um, this young group of employees. And it's not just making a difference, but making a, a, that personal impact. Um, and then praise and recognition, probably from this child to child that everybody gets a trophy and everybody gets an A and so on. Um, and this, this is not entirely a bad thing because giving praise for work well done is good. We don't want to take it too far. It's again, this finding this happy medium. 
but um, you know, it was in a previous era. I remember a, a, um, a lawyer um, in his 60s told me once. He said, you know, when I was a young associate, not getting yelled at was praise. And so it's probably good that we left those days behind. You do want to give praise. You do want to say what has been done well. So that's a, a good development. And then when you do give criticism, putting it in the context of praise is usually the easiest way to do it. The classic technique, which many of you know is the sandwich. Praise, criticism, praise. Your criticism is the meat in the middle. Uh, but you do want to mix that up with the praise, and they're a little more likely to hear you. Um, this is also the thing I've, I've really noticed works very well with this group. They have heard about competition since they were babies, and how you have to be successful, and do this to be successful, and so on. And even things that may not look that attractive at first glance, if you say, look, the reason I'm asking you to do this, or the reason we're doing it here, is so the company can be successful, and then so you can be successful, and it can be promoted and reach your goal. So tying things to their future success, uh, is language that they that they like to hear. Um, of course, there's also this common, um, now common, uh, trend toward uh, peer 360 feedback. This group really likes that idea because then uh, it's not just they're being evaluated, they get to have a say in the matter as well. So that's popular with them. Um, and then the six month review or the annual review, they really want to hear from you a lot more often than that. Uh, so that's another thing that has become more, more common uh, in, in working with this group, is they expect feedback to be right away, not to take it till the end of the year. So, so what strategies have worked for you in motivating your young employees? And you want to share? Even though they're young, long-term sustainability, she has uh, three, you know, she's had three jobs in, in a year and a half. And, but, uh, if you look forward, are you planning to have a family or get married or do you want a career position? What we have to offer you is a long-term career where you can count on this and benefits and then have the stability to plan whatever you want in the way of a family, marriage, uh, or those kinds of things, which they're not focused on right now, but I think you can get their mindset saying, you know, a job every six months isn't going to sustain me through life and what we want to accomplish. So I think that's... Uh, it's a tricky argument for somebody at that age. The long-term sustainability and career paths, uh, they probably can relate to their parents on that and uh, say, you know, my, I don't think I would have, if I hadn't grown up in a, in a stable environment where my father or my mother had uh, stable jobs, that I, I would have been what I am today. Anything else? Well, well, I think all jobs need to be, a candidate who, is offered a job it's based on his or her skill set and potential and that's the main criteria come hella high water quite frankly for legal reasons as well uh, but I think the sell message that the company offers and the, and the potential and all the good that it offers is really what you need to do to attract you know candidates to your company and I think everybody in this room knows that but specifically you want to stay on the straight and narrow and just look to see what the candidate has and how you feel they will perform in your environment. And then you sell, and if you like what you see, then you sell them on the potential. I think that's pretty straightforward. But each company does it differently. This is more about our clients, really, than about my company, which is really small. But uh, game structure is the thing that, that we see as being super potent with uh, our clients in every size of organization. Uh, because it's very agile. And uh, it allows uh, many different kinds of entry points. You're dealing with a generation that has grown up in the video gaming environment. They've never read a set of instructions in their lives. They want to learn by doing. They want to learn by playing and engagement. And you have something very important going on in the business world right now in the software development uh, 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 realm in, uh, called agile development, uh, which is, it goes by the name, it's, it's labeled the cooperative game. And agile development is a way of developing software very quickly. Uh, roles change sometimes every day, sometimes multiple times a day. So for a gaming generation to go in and say, you know, we use game structure, um, you know, is, a, is a, I think a very potent thing. And we actually have clients um, where the deliverables are game structures that we uh, play through the, cor the course of six months or a year. And it's been a very uh, successful strategy for us. And for them. So uh, one, one more, and then we'll keep, we'll keep it on time, because I, I actually think I got the sequence a little bit out, because I think you guys are supposed to do your skit before this, and I forgot, because you did your great improv. So we'll hear from them, and then from you, and then we'll go to them. Okay, so the other thing I'm motivating, I think, speaks to the 
role play here is um, milestones and targets and objectives that it's almost the check the box deliverables to you know have that intrinsic have achieved this. Yeah. And if you want to be a project lead, then a small project to start. Um, you know, it's not a, you know all the way there, but it's here's the milestone that you're starting down that path. Good. Yeah, and that really fits in that praise and instant feedback. Now, did you guys have a, a skin on this, or were we going to use the one at the beginning where we did the criticism of the report? Well, we, we have a continuation of that. Okay. That probably Let's would have that. been better before, but it's fine. I'm sorry about that. No, that's, that's okay. It's your show. We're just helping out. Uh, <laughs> uh, Alexis, I, I still need to go over this report again. I, we didn't have a lot of time before. I, I, I understand the, the smiley face. What was that again? It's an emoticon. Emoticon, okay. Um, I really needed to get this <laughs> yesterday. My deadline to you was yesterday, so getting it today is late. Oh. And that makes it late for my boss. No, I'm sorry about that. I should have told you before. I had a new section that I wanted to add to the end. So I added that, and rather than giving it to you yesterday, because it wouldn't have been done, it wouldn't have been as good, I gave it straight to the client, which <laughs> I want to talk about. They loved. It was, it was a really interesting interaction, and I think they appreciated it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's not how we do things here. Um, there's a there's like a, a ladder, like a progression of bosses. Uh, you work for me. You don't work for the client. Um, we support the client, but you work for me. I hired you. you I'm your boss. You meet my deadline. Get it to me because I have to give it to my boss, the president. He needs it by his deadline. I give it to the board, and then they present it to the client um, or have somebody present it. And, uh, and it's not your place to add new sections to, to, we gave you a format. We showed you that when you first started here. Um, stick to the format, put in the information that we asked for, and, and then submit that. And then if somebody along the line higher up decides that we need more paragraphs or no, more. No, we do need the new section. The new <laughs> section is on how our clients can stand out. That's why they hire us, because it's a competitive world and they need to be able to stand out. That's so true. the new section should have been there in the first place. I added it because <laughs> it's something they need to know about. And I don't know if you talked to my clients, but they said this is one of the best reports they've gotten in the last year. Yeah, but that's not the way we do it. <laughs> this is the way that you should do it. If it's not working, it should be changed. If it isn't broken, we don't fix it. <laughs> it is broken. This is new and it needs to be added or they're not gonna understand how they can stand out. This is a good idea. <laughs> okay, and these different colors down here for your name? Yeah, they're just, just black and white. It's not the color. Don't, don't add to it, don't make it look pretty smiley and pretty. Just a report. Okay, are we, are we done? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> good, good work overall, though. Yeah. All right. Which of uh, the things that we threw out there do we do we want to do? Well, just a good copy. I, mean, so yeah. I, I don't know who wrote this, but clearly there's something broken up on both sides, right? It's been written so that we. Yeah. I mean, she's got something going on that's valuable to the company, and she doesn't understand chain of command. He understands chain of command, but he's not in a position. So I mean, there's there's so many things that you need to tinker with here to get this right. I'm not sure where to start, but it's interesting that they both have their issues Absolutely. and they both have their strengths. Right. Absolutely. I mean, could, could he have recognized that, I mean, flexibility factors, that maybe that paragraph is important. Obviously, there was an indication outside the box that the, the client liked it. And say, in the future, uh, go ahead, and if you have an idea like that, tell me you're working on something, and then get it to me first, because we may want to add that and uh, encourage that, yeah, maybe we can change it. Maybe there is a better product that we can get out of it, but we have to follow a systematic format. but. Uh, not just reject your uh, added paragraph and that sort of thing. See if you can incorporate it into the existing project by you know, flex flexing a little. So that's that's some of the criticism and praise part. Yeah, I don't think the the supervisor was terrible, but no, he's bad. He's he bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know personally. <laughs> he wasn't acknowledging anything she was saying, so he wasn't really being supportive of her at all, and that's probably not good for any generation, perhaps especially for, for Gen Y. So if you're not going to acknowledge anything this person has to say, um, that's just going to make the conversation go south fast. Okay. Yeah, that's those ba that basic communication principle, absolutely. It, I, I just have a question, and, and 
it goes back to something Mike said about game structure. I think games are very, so the metaphor is saying, hey, listen, let me, just, let me step outside and say, this is a bit of a game, right? And the game is that you're working within our universe and you gotta go through channels. Now you're doing some really creative stuff here, it's gonna add a lot of value. But let me work with you and show you how the game works so we can get all this great stuff in, and I'm also show you the rules to the game. And this is what I'll say to students. I'll say, listen, I'm not on an authority trip on you because everything I'm telling you right now is going to be useful for your next job. So it's like a game. I like that. Play the game. Yeah. 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 They let you respond to the game a Right. And then they're hearing, here's how it will help you succeed. It's tying into their success. Absolutely. So to follow up on that, mm -hmm. improvisation uses the phrase yes and. And so he had a lot of no buts or yes buts. And if you're yes anding, you're, you're co-creating a narrative. And if he would yes and her, he would find ways to accept the reality that this thing is already out of the bag, that the client's already seen it, that, and, and, and then her response could be one that would be similar in a way. I mean, she could mirror that at that point because he's modeling it. So the yes and is a key phrase. So you can't say yes but? Yes but is yes not a, and. Yeah, yeah. Yes but is a, almost worse than no. Yeah. Someone we found out when she went to the client right away, and that, and what we find with Gen, gen Wives is they, they like to go right to the boss, or the boss's boss. So they'll just yeah. walk down to the CEO's right. office and sit down and go, hey, you tell me this email. idea that I got. Email. And we're like, well, I'm email. out. You're well, order, well, you know? yeah. So what we tried to do is actually go to them and bring them into to board meetings or whatever else it is to show their ideas. Maybe their department heads with them, but they come in and they can get that exposure and that sort of thing. And, it, and it's worked pretty well. But but initially, you know, all those baby boomers are like, you can't just do that. You can't just walk down the hall and walk in. But, you know, they don't, they don't think of those structure and hierarchy. That's right. not the way they, they operate. So we tried to meet them somewhere halfway. And, you know, stay within the structure to some degree. We'll bring you into our, you know, this meeting and you can present. And there you go. Okay. So does that give you guys enough to, to work with what you've heard? Yep. Okay. She needs a lot of that input. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's getting it. So <laughs> one-sided, I feel. <laughs> Did you guys ride together? Cause Feeling the love. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I might. <clears throat> Alexis, you have a minute? I, I want to continue talking about this uh, report I got from you. Uh, yeah. Late, actually. Um, oh, I, I actually I should have told you about that before, but I wanted to add that new section you saw at the end, and I knew if I gave it too much time, it wouldn't be there, so I was able to fit it in and give it straight to the clients. Okay, well, th that's great. I, I appreciate that you did that extra work because I, I saw that. That's something else I want to talk about. That data was really, really informative, and I think it's something that we will probably want to include in the future. Excellent. So thank you for that. Um, I, I guess just on, on, on the slight negative side, I, think I wish you'd just come to me first and we could kind of work through it because there's probably something more that we could add to that. And so I love that you have that idea. Just run it by me real quick first before we throw it to the client. Um, so we can make sure we have the better product all around. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's not perfect. I wanted to know if we could maybe get together with the board and add a completely new section that's in all the new reports. Great, because that was my other point that I wanted to, to, to mention was that I think uh, we have what we call an open door policy, an open email policy, however you want to look at it. Feel free to let us know these ideas in advance, before the deadline, preferably. Um, so that, so that we're not running behind. But if you have these ideas, fantastic. We'd love to hear them. Feel free to shoot me an email, come by, see me, maybe you know, go see the president and ask, hey, do you have a minute? I'll sit down and shoot your shit, you know, whatever it takes. Um, <laughs> so throw your ideas out to us before the, the deadline, before the client gets it. Um, so that we can have just that wonderful product. And a little bit of culture, that was really cool too. So you're, you're very creative, and I, we're so glad that you became a part of our team. Um, you're doing some great things here, so we really appreciate all your efforts. Um, okay, well, so, I'll, yeah, great. I'll do that next time. But, but you like it? And then what's left is explained this way. The kids who behave well and get good grades develop high self-esteem, not the other way around. Trying to build up self-esteem for no particular reason, you're special just for being you, kind of the way that you, you often do it, that puts the cart before the horse. It, it doesn't work that way. Another illustration of how there's not such a close connection between self-esteem and success as many people believe is here in the US, the ethnic group that has the lowest self-esteem is Asian Americans. And the kids have the best academic performance and the adults have the lowest in employment rate. Now this is a cultural thing because this is a culture that places more importance on self-improvement instead of just thinking highly of yourself. There's a distinction there that's important and it may actually be one of the reasons for the, the higher performance. So, another problem, of course, 
is that self-esteem can cause problems if it's not based in reality. It's tempting to say that's not the way we've been teaching it, but perhaps we have. So, I, I've uh, done a lot of research on this question of positive self-views increasing over the generations. So what I'll share with you today is just the most recent and the largest study on that topic. And in this case, I'm drawing from uh, this very large survey that's run out of UCLA. It gets a nationwide <coughs> sample, nationally representative sample, every year of uh, entering college students. Huge sample. On these questions, 7 million respondents since 1966. It's a great uh, re resource to find generational differences. And one of the questions, or actually a series of questions that it asks, is rate yourself on each of the following traits as compared with the average person your age. So if you're choosing highest 10% or above average, you're saying, yeah, I think I'm better than my peers at this particular trait. So what I was interested in is are there generational differences in thinking that you are above average compared to your peers? So just for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to show you the endpoints. 66, that's entering college students 1966. That's going to be the uh, first wave of the boomer generation. And then the most recent data is very recent. It is from just this past fall in 2011, and that's the Gen A or millennial or Gen Y sample. Okay, so what percentage in each of those generations believe that they are above average in these traits? So the first is intellectual self-confidence, and there's been a clear rise in that. Social self-confidence, more also there, more think they're above average compared to the previous generation. Um, drive to achieve, leadership ability, public speaking ability, Writing ability, which many college faculty would challenge. <laughs> Math ability, artistic ability, and general academic ability. Now we wanted to consider alternative explanations for this. So the first one we considered was maybe people actually have gotten smarter. That's a possibility. So we looked at standardized test scores. Say the SAT or there's other um, assessments of educational progress that are taken in 12th grade. Those are either unchanged or down. So that doesn't seem to be the explanation. Another one is, well, this is a college sample. What about has selectivity changed? Well, more people go to college now than did in the mid-1960s. So if you're going to think about them comparing themselves to the average person, this is a less select sample as time goes on. If, you were, if it was explained by how selective the sample actually was, these numbers would go down instead of up. So that didn't seem to be the explanation either. So those are those two explanations that we considered. Now next we said, what about working harder? Well, okay, their intelligence, at least on the standardized test, is the same. So they're thinking they're above average. Maybe they're thinking this because they work more. Uh, that's possible. And then the second one we wanted to look at was grades. So subjective feedback that they're getting from teachers, uh, which is kind of a cultural indicator in a lot of ways. How has that changed? So we look at that within uh, this nationally representative <laughs> sample of high school students, try to take out any college selectivity issues as well. And that one goes back to the mid-70s. So first, here's how uh, grades have changed. The percentage. I do. Yeah. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> I don't use that term anymore. Huh? I'm retired army. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Shoot the ball now. Yeah, got it. That's it. Right. Good job. She was happy at the end, so that. They made up. If, so, if, he had jumped I, in, if he had jumped in when she said it's not perfect, if he had jumped in with a yes and right there, mm -hmm. that would have turned the whole conversation toward what would make it perfect. So there was a there was a half a beat in there that if he had jumped in, that was the spot. Then they could have wheeled around on that. Sorry, thank you. That's okay. No, this is this is just improvisation coaching. But, <laughs> there, but there it was. Right there. Thanks. There's a realism, though, too. I mean, I don't care what board you had. You're not going to, uh, uh, an entry level employee is not going to wander into the boardroom and say, I just got an idea. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Maybe he does, I guess. When he does. All right, thank you guys so much for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.